So are you more of a deer guy than an elk guy? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. How and come? I don't, you know, I read like David Long's book years ago. I don't know if you've read that anyways. He's like probably one of the best mill deer hunters there is. And he was talking about, you know, like these high country deer and stuff. And they're just really cool. They're super unique. Everyone's different, you know, and you can like with an elk. Yeah, you can get non-typical stuff, but, it, you know, it's fairly common with deer. And even the typicals are all different. That's what I really like about them. And you can actually scout for them. That's the thing with elk. Like if you find one in August, even if you have a bow tag, he's probably not maybe at the very start of archery season, but he's probably not going to be there. Yeah. These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. The Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by Sig Sauer. Sig is a leading provider and manufacturer of firearms, electro optics, ammunition, air guns, and suppressors. For over 250 years, Sig Sauer Inc. has evolved and thrived by blending American ingenuity, German engineering, and Swiss precision. Today, Sig Sauer is synonymous with industry-leading quality and innovation, which has made it the brand of choice amongst the U.S. military, the global defense community, law enforcement, competitive shooters, hunters, and responsible citizens. Sig Sauer is also a premier provider of of elite firearms instruction and tactical training at the Sig Sauer Academy located in New Hampshire. For more information about Sig Sauer and its complete line of products, visit SigSauer.com. Who are you? Well, my name's Zane Hermans. Um, I live down out just outside of Wallawa. Lived here my whole life. Um, that's about it, I guess. <laughs> it's a weird question, isn't it? To try and summarize and like, like, who are you, you know? Yeah, for sure. And uh, how old are you? I'm 20 years old. See, and that's the other hard thing. It's like, you're not even who you are yet. You're just becoming something that you're eventually going to be. Yeah. That's, you've been hunting and fishing for a while? Yeah, my whole life. So. What's, what got you interested in it? Um, you know, I don't know, just going with my dad, I think, and just something about it. I've always really, really liked it. Like it's all I've been into just hunting and trapping, just outdoor stuff. I don't know. It's really all I think about every day. Yeah. You work pretty hard at it. Yeah. Unsuccessfully a lot of the time. (laughs) How, how do you define success at this stage in your life? I guess getting what I wanted to get so if that's filling the tag that's filling the tag but I don't like I'm never that upset I still enjoy the process and stuff and I really just love scouting and stuff so it's okay if I don't kill something but it's really a disappointment too and you wait all year and then you're unsuccessful so yeah and that that definition of success is another thing that changes a lot and changes for me throughout the season like whether I'm guiding or whether I'm who knows what, you know, it's, it's always going to change. And if you're guiding, you're just trying to achieve somebody else's success, but that's also like your job. So you're trying to be successful at your job. But I, I still feel like if I've got a tag in my pocket, then my goal is to punch that tag. And depending on the situation, that might mean a specific type of animal or specific age class, whatever, but it's always changing, you know? Mm-hmm. Has it changed for you? Like when you're 12 and you could first start hunting big game here, were you just excited to, to shoot whatever? Yeah. I think like my first two years, I didn't make it halfway down the driveway and I was killing the first buck I saw, but I don't know anymore. I've like this year, I passed up on a few bucks I could have killed and just waited the whole year and then never ended up getting anything, but it's, yeah, I'm going for something bigger. Tell me about how you prepared for your buck season this year. Well, lots of hours on Google Earth. 
I'm pretty much on Google Earth every single day just looking at something. Um, and then once late June rolled around, that was my first scouting trip. And I went up to this area I've looked at for years and didn't see anything besides lots of goats, sheep, elk, everything but deer. That's really typical where I hunt. And then I think I went on maybe four more scouting trips throughout the summer. Um, just checking off spots that I've looked at on Google Earth. And most of the time around here, you don't even see a deer. Like you always see elk, usually goats, sheep, but we just really don't have that many deer. So, And what's the deal with that? Because there used to be a ton of deer here. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I think it's got to be predators. Yeah. I, I think there's habitat issues probably a little bit too but predators it's got to be the main issue i mean half the time hiking around especially when there's snow you see just as many big cat tracks as deer tracks so if they're eating a deer a week i mean that's that takes a toll and we don't really have a good way to manage them besides really just getting lucky and seeing one i don't know i guess that's kind of what we can expect yeah you know when i was talking with uh Ike Eastman earlier this year, he, he was talking about that, uh, that project that they've been doing in Wyoming, you know, and did you listen to that show? Yeah, I watched the YouTube video. Okay. Yeah. So some of those does were coming back to the same valley every year. Yeah. And then the bucks that were born from those does were also coming back to that same area. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, if you think about a mountain lion working in a mountain basin, if they kill the deer that are in there, which there's not very many to start mm -hmm. with in these, these high mountains. But if they kill all those deer, then there's no more does to have a fawn that wants to come back to that spot. Yeah. So even though it's awesome habitat and there's no roads, there's no pressure, it's pure wilderness. Yeah. Then there's, there's no deer that want to go there. Yeah. That's interesting. So once it's cleaned out, it's maybe permanently cleaned out. You know, it would feel like permanently, but, we've we've come back from worse before mm -hmm. so in like 1900 yeah, there's almost no deer at all right mm -hmm. and then by 1959 we hit the peak of mule deer throughout yeah. the west and as as that population grows they've got to fill new yeah. places they've got to find yeah. new homes but while you have a shrinking population you can lose a huge swath of habitat and i mm -hmm. think that's what's going on yeah and there's other predators besides mountain lions you know those bobcats kill plenty of deer mm -hmm. um, coyotes kill plenty of deer especially yeah. fawns mm -hmm. bears kill a huge number of deer yeah mm -hmm. and then you've got a bunch of wolves on yeah. top of that and then yeah. a bunch of lions it's a hard place to be a deer yeah if they can make it to maturity here uh, they've really done something they got to be pretty smart or pretty lucky at least tell me about that wolf kill you found the other day um so i was hiking along I was checking bobcat traps and it's a really, really long hike, like stupid long. What's uh, stupid long? Uh, it's 21 miles. So your trap line was 42 miles long. Yeah. 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 So, Round trip. Yeah. It's well, okay. probably further than that. It was 21 to my base camp and then maybe like three miles up. Okay. So, and you're doing that all on foot. There, yeah. It's not stupidly. <laughs> no, not with four wheelers. You no. can't. It's not yeah. legal there. Mm. It's crazy. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It, yeah, it's really a lot of work. But I want to. Well, I'll get to the wolf thing in a second. But okay. um, how many sets are you putting out? Um, well, I kind of learned what I'd do better. But this year I had mostly snares, just easy use. You know, super lightweight. Um, I only had like a dozen footholds, but and the snares were just blind sets. You know, no lure, nothing. Just setting like really faint trails, pinch points, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But. I caught four cats and three of the cats were in the 12 foot holds. So okay. I learned if I would have set like 40 foot holds, probably would have happened a lot faster. How are you uh, even going to carry 40 foot holds though? Um, horse. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not hiking again. Yeah. But that's the plan anyways. And so you get all the way in there and this is back, back in the mountains, fairly high elevation, cold, mm -hmm. cold weather. You know, the season opens December 1st. Is yeah. that right? Mm-hmm. What was what did your base camp look like? Did you have a big luxury wall tent, no. uh, wood stove? Um, it's a Lux tent. That's the brand, and it's like a four person tent. 
and it's barely a one person if you put a stove <laughs> in it. And it's like, I mean, I'm tall anyways, and it's terrible. You can't stand up in it. It's just kind of a cheap tent. Water's dripping all over you. Like, it was bad. Did you um, have a stove in there? Yeah, I did have a stove. So that was nice. A little titanium thing or something? Um, No, actually, I do have like a little titanium stove. But, you know, Sky Krebs, mm-hmm. he's an old sheep herder stove. And he gave it, well, he's letting me use it anyways. And you can fit like a full-size piece of wood in there. Okay. So that way it'd actually burn a while. Since those little stoves, you know, it's like half an hour to an hour, it seems like. And it's already running out. But yeah. this one will last like half the night. So Okay. But it takes up more space. So Heavier, I'm sure. Yeah, way heavier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What I've found with the titanium stoves is just I'll, you know, build a fire while I'm in the tent in the evening, mm-hmm. kind of settling down, yeah. you know cleaning a gun or whatever you got to do before you go to bed. And, uh, and then I'll let it go all the way out, which doesn't take very long. Yeah. And I'll get a new fire ready to go. Mm. And then first thing in the morning, I'll stick, stick my arm out and light it up. And then in, you know, just a few minutes, your tent's really warm and you can get out and get ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think in the future I would take a wall tent or, Maybe like a, you know, like a big seek outside or kafar or something like that. Just something a lot nicer. But. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are both, both really good options. And I've used, I guess I haven't, I've, I've slept in seek tents, but I've got a, a big uh, kafaro TP, like an eight man, which mm-hmm. um, again, is like two people with gear. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't ever want to spend a night in there with seven other people. That's just yeah. crazy. <laughs> but uh no, there, there's a lot of good options. Viam Outdoors uh, out of Montana. Mm-hmm. They make a, a really nice tent that's a, a lot cheaper and, and lighter, too. Um, so I've got got one of those that I use quite a bit. It packs down tiny. It's like, I don't know, half the size of a football. And I think that tent and the titanium stove is uh, like two and a half pounds, three pounds. Yeah. It's like that's really nice. nice. Yeah, I might be getting those numbers wrong, but it's it's insanely light. Yeah. So when you're trapping stuff out there, are you are you skinning it while you're yeah. out there? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then are you just rolling the hide up and mm-hmm. stretching them when you get home? Yep, that's what I did. Are you fleshing them out there? No, just skinning them, rolling them up, taking them home, and then doing everything else here. Okay. Because um, that's the other thing, you know, I had to work outside since it's so tiny in there. And it gets dark so early, you're in there like 13 hours, right. which is, that just gets really old. You get a lot of sleep. But, yeah. So yeah, that's what I did. I just skinned them out there since there's, well, I did, I packed one all the way out since I caught it on the way out, but you really don't want to be adding that much weight to your pack. Sure. So, What would you do differently with your snares? You know, I don't know. I just don't think, I, I think I would just set more footholds because the thing about snares up there is you get snow and they just get ruined, you know, mm-hmm. cause those cats are, they're stepping up higher. So your snares are too low or the snow sits on them and drags them down. So that was the main issue with them, I think. And like crossing logs and stuff, I'd definitely set snares and stuff like that. Really good pinch points. But I just think footholds with lures and stuff is the way to go. Yeah. I know uh, Aubrey Barton, who I had on here before, she's uh, she's foothold trapping on logs a little bit. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. And I've seen some really interesting sets where guys will put sort of a mafia set where they've got two footholds yeah. mm-hmm. right next to each other with a little stepping stick in between, and they'll notch down into the log and set those things in yeah. there. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of critters that'll cross a log. Yeah, that's you know? true, yeah. Um, a raccoon or a bear or a bobcat mm-hmm. or a mountain lion. Yeah. You know, you saw mountain lion tracks across that one log. Yeah. Um, everything wants to not get wet if they can avoid it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you, you find the, the perfect log and not your leg hold in there. It might work really well. Yeah. I don't, it probably would. I don't know. It's like, you know, it's a time issue too. Sure. Just being efficient. So that's one of the reasons like snares on logs is just really fast. Super um, fast. But even on those logs, you know, they get weighed down with snow and they kind of quit working too. So Mm -hmm. what kind of leg holds are you using? Um, Well, a few different kinds, but some Bridger number threes and then actually just some like some pretty cheap Duke one and three quarters, Mm -hmm. which I think people think is too small. But 
I caught two in the one and three quarters and they held them fine. Yeah. Uh, um, do you have a favorite trap? Yeah, I think those bridge are number threes. They're the way to go, at least for land trapping. But as far as like water trapping, you know, conivers, they're for sure the way to go. Are you, uh, are you night latching them? Uh, yeah, actually some of them, some yeah. of them I'm not. Okay. Uh, are you going through and, and, uh, and testing pan tension and getting dirty uh, with well, that stuff? No. And I, I don't, well, I kind of learned my lesson. So those have like, no, I think some people use like three or four pounds for cats I've heard, but mine is just loose, you know, and I caught my fair share of pack rats. So, okay. but I also caught a Martin, which I wouldn't have caught if I would have had like four pound pan tension. So what is a Martin? Um, it's a, in the Mustelid family. So it's similar to like a mink, weasel, wolverine. It's in that family. They live kind of in higher elevation forests. Um, they eat a lot of squirrels. That's their main diet. Squirrels, uh, rabbits, stuff like that. And Pretty serious little predators. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What yeah. color are they? They kind of, they have a really cool color. It's sort of like an orangish brown and it differs based on where you are. So they're a lot darker, like up in Alaska. Hmm. And they're also, you know, they're a lot more expensive to buy up there because of that reason. The fur is just better. But like the one I caught has like a huge white patch on its chest, like a really orangey white patch. Um, yeah, it's almost like a creamsicle orange. Yeah, thing. yeah, it's really cool. Actually. Yeah. So, uh, what's a Martin go for this year? Thirty dollars is what I've heard. Okay. What about the bobcats? Uh, it really varies on your cat. So you want like really good white bellies with lots of spots. And I mean, there's cats that'll sell for 150, and there's cats that'll be over a thousand. Uh, the average, who knows, maybe three, four hundred, somewhere in there. But you never can tell. So, wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and they got as high as like six hundred when I yeah. was in college. I remember. Yeah, they were. And there's a couple cats that were a lot more expensive mm-hmm. than that. Yeah, I yeah. heard about some twelve hundred dollar bobcats. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're only allowed how many here? Five cats. Five. Mm-hmm. But if you go to Western Oregon. Yeah, I know you can. Do you know how many you can get? Is it unlimited as long as you just keep buying your tags? I think you can just yeah, keep buying I think them. So, but they're way lower quality cats, right? Too, so. Yeah. Uh, is bobcats the thing you like trapping the best? No, probably muskrats. <laughs> muskrats? Yeah, because it's a guaranteed catch if you get a good <laughs> ditch. Bobcats, like half the time you don't catch anything. Yeah. But muskrats, you find some good sign, you're definitely going to catch some. So. How do you trap a muskrat? Um, what I do, I go along and they make like these feed bed things and it's where they sit and chew on food basically. And it's like a little mat mm-hmm. and I just set any kind of little foothold on it and just wire off of it stake it in somewhere where it'll jump in and drown and that's the way to go and then also if you can find dens you can set like a 110 conibear in there and that's like a surefire like if you find a good den you're going to catch one if you were going to build a a survival kit for the apocalypse right Mm -hmm. um the grid goes down can't get resupplied on anything what kind of traps are you going to throw in your kit well Smaller traps, maybe like some 330s because you could catch like beaver, which is like one of the bigger animals you could catch. But I mean, really like a 110 conibear, like you could catch rabbits, squirrels, and there's lots of that stuff. I think if you went with a foothold, you'd probably just be starving or having to eat like coyotes. So (laughs) I'd rather just eat a little squirrel. Uh, I, I agree. I see... I see these, you know, the guys on the internet or whatever that uh, are building out little survival kits and they they have always got snares in there. Yeah, I I didn't think about snares, actually. But, you know, you use a snare once and it's done. Yeah. Uh You know, okay, so you brought a dozen snares with you. You caught a dozen things. Yeah. You're out of traps. Yeah. That little conibear, it'll work work for the rest of your life. Yeah, Uh that's true. I I think uh, having some 110s, uh, I... uh, all my conibears are double springed, um, mm-hmm. which is kind of dumb. I, I just think that it helps me anchor them a little bit better. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, a little bit yeah. easier to, to get them set right, I feel like. Yeah. But I'm not a good trapper. No. Just not. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I suck too a lot of times. <laughs> it's uh, so disappointing, isn't it? Well, I was listening to uh, Greg Jones. Uh-huh. 
and you're talking about how your traps get dug up and that's me all the time <laughs> I've, I've caught in a few coyotes this year but more times than not like you go over there usually the traps like froze down and yeah. there's tracks all over but um you know jim soars mm-hmm. he's i go with him he knows what he's doing like, yeah he's really good at it so this freeze thaw stuff is yeah brutal. yeah how do you beat that well, I usually just don't set traps right now unless it's water traps. But I know you can use like a lot of people use like wax dirt mm-hmm. and it doesn't freeze down. So that's kind of a way you can't avoid it. But. My struggle when I've used wax dirt is that it's the wrong color. Yeah. Um, so it, it sticks out. It's way lighter than the dirt we have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I guess I could I could make my own wax dirt, which would probably be smart. But I haven't yeah. done that. I just bought it. Yeah. And then... A lot of times, because I'll make like a little bowl shape over the pan, you'll get uh-huh. some water in that that'll yeah. freeze. Yeah. And then you've got ice over the top of your wax dirt. Uh-huh. Well, that's the thing that's nice about cats is they'll step on an exposed trap. Right. So, like, Why do you, what do you think's going through their mind when they do that? I mean, obviously, I they, they don't know about traps, yeah. right? It looks It's a flat spot to step. I don't really know. I know cats, they're more sight hunters than smell hunters, so... I, I don't know, like, but I know people catch them with a shiny trap too, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe they're just not as smart as a coyote, um, or they're just, they're definitely not as wary about that stuff. Yeah. Um, it's really nice though. If you had to cover your traps, it probably just would have had a lot of traps that never went off. So what are you doing to prep your traps? Like when, if you get a brand new trap out of the box, oil all over it, what well, do you got to do before you're ready to put it in the ground? I'm not as good as some people, but a lot of my traps I've bought used and they're already dyed and waxed. But that's what, like, if you're doing a good job, you take them, you boil them, and then you dye them and wax them. And it just basically makes it so they won't rust, keeps them in better shape. Um, Cause yeah, they kind of, they can go to crap fast if you just have a shiny trap and you start setting it out all over the place. But yeah. And it seems like every time you catch something, it's pretty much polished by yeah. the time you get to it. So you've yeah. got to start over. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I never treated my traps more than once in a season. Yeah. Some of them look pretty chunky by springtime. Yeah. You've also got to uh, get them a little bit rusty to start with mm-hmm. to get that dye to stick to them a lot yeah. of times. Mm-hmm. What kind of dyes do you like? Um, I don't know. I really don't know that much about dyes. Like I said, like a lot of my traps, I just... I'm I'm not like great on that kind of stuff, um, but I buy them used and they're already dyed and waxed, and then they basically just don't get dyed and waxed again. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you've you've hoofed it back into the wilderness, 24 miles. Mm-hmm. Checked your trap line. Caught three bobcats on that trip. Two. Bo- uh, two. two bobcats so I, on that trip and a martin. Yeah. And you're on your way back out, um, and you start running into wolf sign. Yeah. Take it from there. Okay, so I basically been running into wolf sign like this whole trip. Fresh tracks running up and down the trail. They just get on those trails and follow them. And you can tell like sometimes there'll be elk that get on it. I just feel bad for those elk getting chased all over the place. Um, But anyways, like this one trip, there's just wolf sign all the way in, spread out throughout the whole way basically. And on the way out, there's a road you get on and you have to climb up like couple thousand feet it really sucks like it is the worst part of that trip since you've gone out 20 miles then you have like two miles of just really steep uphill but i get on this road and there's real fresh wolf tracks running up and down it and i kept following them and i saw some blood spots on the road and i was i knew it was going to get interesting and i figured they killed something i wasn't sure if it was on the road or not but i kept going and i saw a bunch of eagles flying up and sure enough i walked around the corner and there was something just bloody and messy up in the road. So I actually recorded it, but I walked up there and it was an elk calf. And, you know, it was definitely that day. Like, I honestly think it might've been warm. I should have poked it and felt it, but I just didn't think about it. And they'd taken it down on that road and you could see where they drug it down. And what was really interesting about it was You could see like the stomach contents had been ripped out like up above the road. And I guess that was, they must've just been chewing on its hind end and kind of got the stomach open. And then you could see where they had drug it down the road and just like kind of ate the hind end out. But as I was going up from that, I saw like 
several sets of wolf tracks diving off the road. So I'm pretty confident I spooked them off of it. It, it looked to me like that thing was like brand new. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, does that bother you at all? Being out there in a pinchy little tent by yourself way back in the wilderness, wolves around? Uh, probably not as much as it should. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I used to be really freaked out doing like solo camping and stuff, but I don't know anymore. I, I really like it. What do you like about it? I don't know. Like, I don't want to insult my friends since I have some really good friends I go scouting with too. And I like that too. But just like when you get back there, especially like scouting or shed hunting and you are successful, like it's just a really good feeling. Whether that's just seeing a buck on the hillside or picking up a bunch of sheds or catching cats, you know, it's kind of cool just to know that you did it on your own. And it's just enjoyable sometimes not talking, I think. Yeah. But you ever find uh, that you're talking to yourself while you're out there? Yeah, uh, not really out loud in my head all the time. But yeah. I don't like a lot of times I'll listen to like an audio book or maybe a downloaded podcast or something too. So just throwing uh, some ear pods or something? Uh, no, just out loud. Oh, just loud? Yeah, that it's way. Just scaring everything around you? Yeah, well, I figure. I'd rather ha- be doing that um, as compared to having like a wolf or something sneaking up on yeah. you and you can't hear. So yeah, uh, no, I I don't think that I could stand having uh, something in my ears while yeah. I was out there. I've done it before, where I put one in, um, like if I'm sitting over water or something, mm-hmm. and I'm going to be yeah. there for six hours. It's like, yeah, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Oh, let me let me add. I would if I was like hunting like still hunting through some trees or something, I would never be just playing something on my phone. <laughs> oh, obviously, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not not calling you that. You bring a gun with you? Uh, yeah, just a 22, 10-22, and a 22 mag pistol. Hmm. So Can you hit anything with a pistol? Not really. Not really? No, terrible. <laughs> you know, is it a revolver? Oh, uh, semi-automatic. Uh, what is it? kel Oh, yeah. do you have any feet issues with that? Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah, I have that same gun, and I thought it was going to be the coolest gun yeah. in the world. You uh-huh. know, 30-round magazine. Yeah. I love a twenty-two mag. Uh-huh. And it is the loudest pistol oh, I've ever yeah. shot. It's so loud. <laughs> and it it just does not want to put another round in the I know. Chamber. It's like you shoot. That's I always joke with my friends. Like, I'll get my one shot in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hope no that kidding. I scare it since I'm probably not hitting it. Yeah. I mean, it was a it was a good idea. It was a good concept, but they just mm-hmm. didn't put the finish into it to make yeah. it functional. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've wanted to ugly huck that thing into the yeah. bushes more than once. Yeah. When I was first starting a trap, the only pistol I had was a little twenty two revolver, and man, I couldn't hit anything with it. Yeah. And I shot a lot with it, and um, eventually got some some advice and some lessons, and got a little bit better, but. These semi-autos are just, they're such such a better gun. Yeah. You know, the good ones anyways. But a 1022, that's a that's a great option. Yeah. If you want to shoot a grouse or something, you can. Yeah. That's what I like about them. But. Yeah. Well, tell me about how you, I, I want to know more about how you got ready for buck season. Like, what kind of okay. miles are you putting on? Um. Well, I would say most of my scouting stuff is 8+. plus. It's usually off trail a ways. Um, and why are you doing that? Why are you going that deep? Just so I want to know if I find one, I'm going to have it to myself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've hunted Colorado a few times. It doesn't <laughs> matter how far you go in. There's always people. It's yeah. just too popular, I think. And there's a lot of deer. Oregon, on the other hand, some of these spots, you really can get away from people. And no one, I've seen one other guy scouting. I ran into him and he's like a, real well-known killer um that's really it so if yeah. you find a deer back there especially if it's off trail maybe where a horse can't get to it like it's yours yeah, yeah. but it sounds like what you're starting to to find out is there there's a big difference between finding a buck in june or july yeah, very big and difference. finding him in october yeah um they're really easy to find like if i could pick if I were to get lucky and draw the premium Oregon tag for one of these units, I would a hundred percent choose to hunt August over November, just because you can scout like the whole month of July. You can scout into August. 
And if you find one, I would say first of July, like more than likely you're going to find that buck. He's going to be there, you know, clear into October, but he's going to be very visible clear through August. Um, so yeah, like you got to scout. I really think like you can't just expect to show up and shoot a nice buck unless you just get really lucky since they're just not visible in October and there's just not that many of them anyways. So why are they less visible in October? Well, I think there's a combination of reasons. They shed their velvet. For some reason, when bucks shed their velvet, like, you know, light switches, they get into the trees. They're just more nocturnal. You know, it's more of a prime hours deal. Like they're just out very early in the morning, right at last light. Um, and then they're also getting their winter coat. I think that's probably part of it too, is they're just, they get hot and they want to be in the shade. So, okay. Yeah. At least those are the reasons I've heard. But. So do you think that those bucks are staying, that they're still in that area or do you think they've gone somewhere else? Uh, they're the two biggest bucks I've seen their buddies. They're always together for two years in a row now. They've literally lived on this tiny hillside, like within a hundred yards. Like that's where I've seen them. And if it's in the summer, you can just bet that you're going to see them. So, I mean, once they got a spot figured out, I think there's probably flukes, but based on what I've seen, when they have a spot figured out, that's where they go every single year, you know, until they're dead. But yeah. I mean, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier with the mountain lion thing. Mm-hmm. If they find a spot that's yeah. hard for a lion to get up on them, then they mm-hmm. can survive there yeah. their whole life. Yeah. And that's one of my issues with with the way sh- some shed hunters are now in the springtime mm-hmm. is they'll get in there and they're looking for sheds and they'll bump a herd of elk. Mm-hmm. And that herd of elk was in that draw because they could survive there. Mm -hmm. And now you just shoved them into some place that they might not be able to when they're at their absolute weakest. Yeah. And there's a right and a wrong way to go about it. Um, But man, some people are just nuts about sheds. Yeah. Are you one of those people? Are you, are you shed crazy? uh, I'm kind of shed crazy. It's, I really like it. Something to do in the spring, but I definitely understand people's concerns with it, especially some of these areas, you know, people are just driving all over the place. You know, I've heard like people watching bulls and literally seeing an antler fall off and it's just a race to get over there. Yeah. Um, but they're worth a lot. I still think it's exciting because I never end up killing all these animals. So next best thing is getting their sheds. So getting, getting the uh, participation. Price. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I found, several bucks i found their sheds multiple years in a row which is really cool so, that's neat mm-hmm, yeah um and then were those sheds in the same area each yeah year? yeah it's sort of just like i was i was talking about in the summer where they kind of find these spots same with winter yeah i've few of them have been within like 100 yards yeah. for multiple years so yeah that's mm-hmm. amazing isn't it yeah it's really cool what do you think a big snow year like this is gonna do to these deer well, I don't know. It, it's not looking good. I mean, at least it's kind of melting off, but not up high. Yeah, it's not going to be good. Well, there's not that many anyways. It's probably going to just kind of wipe them out. You know, it's sort of flashbacks of, I think it was the 16, 17 winter, you know? Yeah. So I can probably kiss those, get those big bucks goodbye. <laughs> maybe. So maybe not. Yeah. I mean, that might have been the year that they were born honestly yeah you know it totally could have been close to it they're probably you know five six years old somewhere in there yeah. so because that's it's what you need and mm-hmm. that's really the best you can hope for with yeah. these deer that are having to deal with the predator issues that they are mm-hmm. yeah so are you more of a deer guy than an elk guy yeah yeah oh yeah how and come i don't you know i read like david long's book years ago i don't know if you've read that anyways he's like probably one of the best mill deer hunters there is and he was talking about you know like these high country deer and stuff and they're just really cool they're super unique everyone's different you know and you can like with an elk yeah you can get non-typical stuff but it, you know it's fairly common with deer and even the typicals they're all different that's what i really like about them and you can actually scout for them that's the thing with elk like if you find one in august even if you have a bow tag it's probably not maybe at the very start of archery season but he's probably not going to be there yeah and 
I still think it's funny. I think if I would have focused on elk, I would have been successful a lot earlier. I see a lot of big bulls scouting a lot more than bucks. So, mm. And uh, is archery part of your game or most of no. rifle? I should get into it. Like this buck I found this last year, my friend and I found it uh, two years ago and then we refound it this year. But like I have a video of him and it was archery season out feeding, but I had a rifle tag. But I just think some of these bucks, like they're kind of unkillable with a bow, I feel like. Like they're in a spot where you can't really bed them up and go stalk them. There's cliffs, stuff like that. So I think your only real good shot is with a rifle, but that's risky too. So, yeah, I tip my hat to anybody who consistently gets it done on mule deer in yeah. in the Alpine in in the high country. Yeah, it's such a hard hunt. Yeah, mm -hmm. such a hard hunt, and you've just got to spend some time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. You can't roll, they don't bugle, you know, you yeah. can't just roll in there and, you know, wake up in the morning and rip off a bugle and be like, oh, there's an elk over there. We're yeah. going to go hunt him today. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Yeah. They're just harder to see in general too. Yeah. yeah. And they're, yeah. they're just cagey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we don't get to hunt during the rut. Most of the country does. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty jealous that the guys in Montana, they get to hunt yeah. most of the state general season every year in the rut. Yeah. Like, it's got to, it seems easy, doesn't it? Yeah. We have 10 days and in, it's in the early October. Time. It's yeah. the hardest time of year to mm -hmm. hunt deer. Yeah. Yeah. It for sure. It's really, it's not easy rifle or bow, but I don't know. They're still there. That's one nice thing about having only two seasons is they're probably going to survive. It's not mm. like Colorado where you have like, I don't know, five seasons or something they could get killed in. Yeah. So. Yeah. No kidding. Colorado just has nonstop mm -hmm. seasons. Yeah. And if they end up moving muzzleloader, it sounds like they're going to have another season, right? Yeah. I don't know. Because they're, that's the debate right now is do you make bow hunters where hunters yeah, are orange that's true. I hear that. or do you move muzzleloader season to some some other block oh yeah that would really that would shake things up a little bit what about the early rifle hunters do you know about that i don't know huh. yeah yeah i i'm not great at following all the regulation changes of course we had this debacle with uh utah banning game cameras yeah. it just happened mm -hmm. and i got word that oregon um talked about it in general terms last year but it's going to come before the commission this year really um so if if oregonians want to keep game cameras they need to start getting involved that's, otherwise it's going to go away it's interesting that they would target game cameras i don't feel like that's a maybe it is in some spots it doesn't seem like a huge deal here you know maybe it is in some spots for, for me it's it's something that's interesting and i learn yeah. a lot from it but a game camera does not kill an animal. No. Mm -hmm. um, and Utah banned it on private land too. Oh, really? That's a yeah. huge overreach. Yeah. I mean, that's somebody owns that land. Yeah. And you're saying that's you crazy. can't put a camera on it? But isn't there like a, can't you technically set them if you just want to like look at game and it's not for hunting purposes? Or is that maybe in Arizona or something they did that? I don't know. I don't know how they phrased it. And it's yeah. it's for half the year, right? It's like yeah, July through December yeah. or something. I can see like like the Arizona Strip and stuff where those water holes have like 20 cameras on them. You know, I could see it because um, I think some of those big deer, once they get found, they get killed in those units. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd mix it up a little bit. There'd actually be a few big deer that get away. Yeah. But, Hard to enforce. Yeah. It's you really can't enforce it. But. Yeah. I was talking with a, with a buddy a couple of days ago about it. He said, you know, I'm thinking about putting cameras in some super deep remote places with yeah. little love letters to whoever wants to go in there and find them. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you don't go get them when you set them in really deep. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think it's kind of crazy. Um, there seems to be a, a war against technology. And, yeah. and they, they're they really being picky about what they're picking. 
So you think about all the technology that is fully acceptable, like using mm. Google Earth. You're yeah. scouting oh, where you yeah. want to hunt I mean, with satellites in outer space. It's huge. Yeah. Right? And and that's totally okay. That's yeah. good to go. But yeah. like, do you want to have any kind of electronics in your site? Like, no, 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 no. Yeah. We've got to shut that down. Yeah. I, not- that's that's funny because Google Earth and OnX and stuff, I mean, they're huge. If I didn't have that, like, You'd actually have to know what you're doing, but you can hop on your phone in <laughs> five minutes, look at everywhere within a unit and yeah. see exactly what it looks like. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, hunting out of state when I was a kid and none of that was available was such a yeah. daunting thing. Yeah. It's like you're going to call the Forest Service there and mm-hmm. order paper maps and yeah. start looking at it. And you really have no idea what you're actually looking at. You don't know if there was a fire there or if that road is still open or if that trail is brushed in. Yeah. Um, so if you didn't have somebody that lived there or who had hunted there for years to mm-hmm. tell you, you're just guessing and it probably wasn't going to work. Yeah. Well, that's probably, you know, point creep going up. I'm sure that's a lot of it. It's just so easy to research stuff now, figure yeah. out where you're going to go. I think a lot of people just didn't do it since it was really hard in the past. But Yeah. Yeah, the the research is easy, but the work is still hard. Like if you if you mm-hmm. want to go miles deep into the backcountry, that's still a very yeah. difficult thing to do. Yeah, and I I've said it before, but I don't think people. It, it it's a special group of guys um, who can actually go and do an elk hunt in the backcountry mm-hmm. very deep at all because they're just too heavy. They're, yeah, you're going to lose meat mm-hmm. unless you've got five or six guys and you can split that thing up and. If you're carrying your your camp on your back and an elk and your bow, yeah. it's, it's so many miles. Yeah, and not to mention you're actually having to move around a lot with deer, you know. A lot of times it's just sitting there glassing mm-hmm. until you actually find them. But elk, you're moving up and down, going all over the place. Yeah. So. And one guy can carry a whole deer. Oh, yeah, no. that's true. Um, mm-hmm. It's like, okay, yeah. here we go. Uh-huh. You know, it's going to yeah. be heavy, but I'm going to make it out and it's yeah. going to be okay. Uh, when you start adding multiple trips, yeah. that changes things. Yeah, for sure. So what's, uh, what do you think people can be doing to, to help mule deer? You know, this is a really serious thing. It's a struggling population. Um, they, they may not be around for the next generation at the rate they're declining. Yeah. You know, I don't know, I guess probably more people speaking out about the issues with predators maybe that would help i don't know if it's going to help in oregon to be honest but yeah did you see odfw posted the other day something about the the real reason for mule deer decline was cheatgrass oh is that what they said (laughs) (laughs) sometimes i wonder how these cougars are even surviving anymore (laughs) right it's like they gotta be starving too i think that there probably are some cougars that are pretty thin yeah and that's what shoves them down in the valley and yeah. has them eating golden White retrievers tails. and stuff yeah, like that. That's true. I was yeah. getting a haircut in my grand the other day, and the gal said that her daughter just uh, had her dog killed by a lion the night before, and she was in her hot tub outside of her house and heard a thump and a yelp, and this lion had jumped out of a big pine tree yeah. and grabbed this uh, Australian shepherd and killed it. Really? And. Yeah. Uh, you know, she just looked over to see this lion packing her dog off. It was a big cat. Yeah. But she uh, called somebody with hounds, and, and they ran the lion up a tree 50 yards away, and at least she killed the lion. Yeah. But stuff like that happens because those lions don't have enough deer to eat. Yeah. You know, they don't want to be around people. Yeah. They're it's... notorious for, for avoiding people, maybe more mm-hmm. so than any other animal besides yeah. Sasquatch. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And we get them hiding under trampolines in Joseph and stuff like that. Yeah, walking down on the sidewalk in Wallowa. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the Wallowa Cougars. Like. Oh, that's true. It, that one's welcome, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's where like the main mule deer population is anymore anyways. Who's so, in town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Isn't that funny? And another thing that people talk about all the time, um, if they're afraid to talk about predators, is that you know, it, it's really about roads. We need to close these roads down. And then yeah, you, look you, at you see all these deer yeah. in town and all these deer in the valley and yeah. all these deer on ranches where people are mobbing around the four-wheelers all the time. Yeah. 
I don't think that that's it. Yeah, they can adapt for sure. And then you look at, you know, some of these wilderness areas, there's no roads. And half the time, you know, you look at a perfect looking spot, you don't even see a doe. So, yeah. yeah. And, and you can be there. Then That's not just looking it over. Yeah. You'd be there for a week and not see a deer. Yeah. And really beautiful, pristine yeah. habitat. Mm-hmm. You know, perfect deer habitat. Yeah. But they just don't know. Uh, spitballing ideas with a with a buddy and we thought about um i don't know if this technology even exists yet but if you could put a gps collar on a doe Uh that gave her a zone that she could be in and if she got to the edge of that it'd shock her be like a shock Uh collar yeah um so you could basically have an electric pen that was set with with gps and you could move a doe into that area and that would force her to have her fawn in that area uh-huh. and you could start seeding these different zones back in the wilderness and, yeah. and teaching these animals to be in there um, and if you could get them started again i think you might really have something but it'd be a lot of money it'd be a lot of a lot mm-hmm. of science science yeah to actually make it happen but I don't know how else to convince these deer to go back into the wilderness and yeah, reestablish the populations. Well, it's interesting because even like within the wilderness, the deer, there's more deer closer to town. Like there really is like you get way remote and there's just less deer. But some of these big mountains, you know, closer to town and stuff, they seem to have more deer on them. And, you know, that's what I've observed. And I've heard that from some people that know what they're talking about. So. I don't know. I don't know why that is. Um, I'm sure some of these town bucks we see in Joseph, they probably migrate in the summer. Some of them do up there. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, they're probably killable in buck season. But Maybe. Yeah. Go get them. Know. I've heard of people in Utah and stuff doing that, like famous town bucks, and then killing them like 10 miles away. Yeah. Uh, I don't. And a lot of that goes on, especially with – you know, some of the kind of shadier outfits in Oregon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's there's definitely some guys that are shopping those those town deer that have names and Facebook pages and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. And then they're selling them for big money to governor's tag holders. Yeah. When it's the rut and that deer slips up and steps on yeah. <laughs> steps outside of city limits mm-hmm. for a day. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I don't like that very much yeah what's your day job um ranch hand ranch hand yeah so. and you get time off to be able to hunt and scout from that a little bit yeah i got a pretty good deal going okay. so just i don't know not tons but like i don't ever when i have free time that's what i'm doing I, you know that's really all i ever do when i have free time so like right now it's just sometimes in the afternoon go shoot a duck but in the summer, as soon as like we kind of get a break with hang, like I'm going into the mountains. So, yeah. what do you bring with you? Just like my whole gear. Yeah, like if you're gonna go in for three okay. days. Well, I have a Exo Mountain Gear uh, K3 6400 pack, which so far that's my first quality pack, and it's treated me well. It's a great pack. Yeah. I've got the 4800, and yeah, I really love it. Mm-hmm. I'm not as tough as you so i'm not going to get a 6400 otherwise i'd fill it up you're not as stupid (laughs) (laughs) but yeah that's the problem with those big packs is you fill them up yeah but um for optics let's see i have the 10 by 50 swarovski slcs um which were a gift so not like i could afford those and then for spotting scope i have a 20 to 60 power 65 millimeter objective lens uh ats spotting scope swarovski and actually i sold a bunch of sheds this year that's how i got that um that's my optic setup and then just a little one-man tent i think it's the brands ascend Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not a freestanding tent which kind of sucks so if you're on a rocky spot you might be screwed um just a little down zero degree bag uh jet boil fuel canister yeah if i'm scouting I usually just suffer through some top ramen and granola bars because like, you know, peak refill and stuff. That's really nice, but I can suffer for two days instead of spending a lot of money. Typically in the summer, I'm just running jeans and tennis shoes because like I have some QU and some first light and stuff, but 
not that much and i really don't want to like risk tearing it or something so i'd rather just use jeans um and i really like tennis shoes honestly like sometimes i hunt in them yeah so i think trail runners are a great great yeah. option yeah uh-huh they're super quiet yeah mm -hmm. um i i think you're actually less likely to sprain yeah sprain your ankle with a trail runner mm -hmm. and they're so light yeah yeah. That's huge. Mm -hmm, it is. Yeah. You use trekking poles? Yes. Is that what you set your tent up with? Uh, no, actually. Okay. So yeah, trekking poles are really What, what nice. do you mean the tent's not freestanding? Like, um, so, like, you have to stake it out on the ground. Like, if you didn't have stakes, it would just collapse on itself. Okay. So, it's not, you know, like a lot of these tents, when you set them up, you could pick them up and set them anywhere. But mine, you have to find a spot with soft soil that you can drive a stake into four corners um so that's what i mean by freestanding gotcha so, so. gotcha um i don't know i have a lot of other little stuff but i guess that's kind of the main things mm -hmm. top ramen and uh and granola bars nature valley granola bars oh the crunchy ones yeah yeah, yeah. that's yeah. basically just top ramen I feel yeah like. pretty much yeah. yeah i'd rather have top ramen i think than mountain house <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. It really messes with your stomach after a few days. So. Do you have a, a dehydrator or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, I do sometimes during the hunting season actually dehydrate like spaghetti. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a cheap way and it's you're used to eating it, so it works good with your stomach. So mm -hmm. it's like one of the main things that I hate about dehydrated food that you buy or freeze dried food is it really messes with your stomach sometimes. So yeah. Mountain House is notorious for that. Yeah. But. Um, we got a freeze dryer this year and I haven't mm. set it up yet, but I, I want to freeze dry all my own meals, yeah. um, for the next season. Yeah. And I think that'd be really neat. I'll probably wait until this summer when we have all of our produce going and stuff like that. Yeah. And just, I'll be able to just take everything right here from the six ranch and, yeah. and make my own freeze dried meals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh. I think it'll probably make me feel a lot better. Yeah, and, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Some of that stuff, I, I just can't, I can't hardly bring myself to eat three of them in a day, yeah. especially even two of them in a day. Like a lot of times I'll just have like snacks and then I'll yeah. eat one right before I go to bed. Mm -hmm. And you need to be eating throughout the day. Like you've yeah. got to have that energy. Yeah. But it's tough to, to make yourself eat eat those freeze dried meals the, yeah. the peaks are good though yeah, i i will good. say mm -hmm. um the peak refuel ones i think are probably my favorite yeah mm -hmm. but they're what 10 12 bucks a piece yeah yeah, yeah. so it's like it's i don't a lot know. of money for a it's a lot hand. of money <laughs> yeah yeah i'd rather you know like if i'm gonna spend money i want it to be on a tag or on something like optics yeah rather than like clothing even though clothing is important but mm -hmm. yeah yeah, that's smart. Mm -hmm. So what's the future hold for you? You got any big plans for 2022? Um, well, picking up sheds in a couple months and then going back to Colorado. Okay. Third time's the charm. Getting yeah. closer every time. Never got a shot the first time. Missed one last year. Missed? Yes. It was uh, under some weird circumstances. That's my excuse. Like was, sh shot and didn't hit? Yes. Come but on. But all I could see was like, it's throat and I was still hunting and you know, it was funny since I sat there and glassed and the spot that I've hunted two years in a row, I'm done hunting it. But like you see a lot of bucks, but they're always just in the trees before you can get to them. So I finally just started still hunting and I just like, I jumped up these three bucks and two of them were really nice bucks. And I talked to some guy that was bow hunting there and he was showing me pictures of these bucks on this ridge two 190 class bucks. I don't know if that's the one I missed. I missed a really big one, but I was still hunting through and I jumped these bucks and I like chased them, tried to get around them. Of course they got away. And then I was, I was like, oh, I'll just still hunt back through it. And those things had just like come around, bedded right up in front of me. And I saw this stupid little fork and horn step out and I instantly just raised my gun and like kind of just out from behind like this little bush like this big old neck just pops out i could just see the neck and just the rack and like he was about ready to bolt so i probably didn't aim as 
get as I should have. I should have took a half second longer. I'm not sure I would have hit it, but that was a downer. <laughs> That's not very Marine Corps. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I have enough points to draw early rifle tags, so done with the muzzle loaders. <laughs> okay. Oh, that was a muzzle loader? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, oh, yeah, I'll, it's not a rifle. I mean, I'll, I'll I, give that one to you. I have a few excuses. Yeah. But. Yeah, I'll give that one to you. Muzzle um, loaders. I've only muzzle loader hunted once, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I still don't. Yeah, I would like to figure it out. I really don't know what I'm doing either. I know, like, some of these muzzle loaders, you know, like gun works and stuff. They've got some really good ones. Those aren't yeah. even muzzle loaders, though. I yeah, mean, that's true. They're they are rifles. in name, but yeah. yeah. The, yeah. the muzzle loaders that we can use here are, you know, traditional, very traditional. Yeah. Like, you basically have to wear the buckskin diaper yeah, to go pretty with much. it. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Besides that, hopefully, I draw some good organ tags, which won't be that good. Yeah. Um, and then maybe get one of those bucks finally this winter. Cougars doesn't get them, but. Well, you need to get up there and kill a lion. I do. I know. And I've, you know, I've seen, I've only ever seen a few lions. And one time I called one in, I was like 13 and I didn't know what I was doing. Set out some game call. I, was, I think it was just rabbit in distress. And I called a lion in and all 30 out six sitting there just full on this. <laughs> like I was shaking like crazy. Sure. That's yeah. like probably Pretty the best exciting. chance I'll ever get out of line. Yeah. <laughs> But so that sucks. Um, where can people follow along in, in the adventures of Zane Hermans? Well, uh, I have Instagram. It's just, I think it's Zane underscore Hermans. But I will say I'm not very active. I think it's been like five years since I posted. So <laughs> I guess if you want to see like some pictures from when I was 15, go ahead. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's about it for me. So Okay. Well, we'll have to have you back on. Um, next year and and see whether you got a hold of one of those deer or not yeah yeah i wish you all the luck and keep working hard it'll it'll pay off and you know it it's special just being up there yeah you know? for sure it's special just being up there in that country and i'm really proud of you for how hard you're working at this stuff especially the trapping my goodness yeah um doing a a, a trap line that that's that long on foot like that's just incredible it's just stupid. <laughs> well, but, you're doing it, and uh, and you're making a little bit of money at it. And yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's definitely just more of an experience thing. You know, it's like might as well do it while you can. Yeah. Instead of wishing I did do it one day. So good for you. Well, yeah. Well, thanks, buddy. Thank you. So I found this old ad, and there's like dudes dressed up like construction workers and a guy's got a jackhammer and there's a crane and you know they're moving all these big steel beams and stuff aladdin stanley thermos stanley the tough all steel thermos bottle that's completely dependable they're showing this thermos like falling off this building and hitting all this other construction stuff and built to take a bounding year after year <laughs> Get the top. Oh, lands in a wheelbarrow. The guy grabs it out of the wheelbarrow. Now he's going to pour himself a cup of coffee. I love these cheesy old ads. And most of the time, like, they're lying to us, right? That's most of what marketing used to be was just, like, telling a lie or, or at least telling a version of a lie that, that made you think that you needed this thing. But I'll tell you what, when it's cold out like it is right now, the only way to keep liquid liquid and not freezing in your pack is by putting it in something that's insulated so packing a thermos in the winter time is really smart whether it's for a hot beverage like coffee or if you just want to bring some water with you which is a really important thing if you're going to be out adventuring around in this uh in this snow that we've got all over the country and i think you should be because it's a great time of year to get out and about you know this is both a comfort and a safety thing if you want to get something from Stanley, which I encourage you to do, you can use the discount code 6RANCH. That's the number 6 in the word ranch, and that'll get you 25% off of just about anything on their website. I encourage you to do that. They're great supporters of the show and uh, great supporters of this audience, and I love you guys. So stay warm out there, have a nice warm drink, and uh, make sure you're drinking it out of a Stanley product.
Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share the show with a friend. You can also rate the podcast and leave a review. Your support allows me to keep doing what I love, which is meeting incredible folks and sharing their stories with you. For more content and photos, follow the show on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast or me at Six Ranch Outfitters. This episode was produced by Emily Brannigan with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Art for the Six Ranch Podcast was created by John Chatelain and digitized by Celia Christofferson. Tune in every Monday for a brand new episode of the Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week.